Greetings and welcome to Conversations at Noon on the Connecticut Freedom Trial. I'm Tammy Denise. In 1995, the Connecticut Journal made the Connecticut Freedom Trial a law and it opened officially September 1996. The invention of the Connecticut Freedom Trial was to acknowledge the struggle for freedom and dignity of the Black and African American communities. When the Freedom Trial first opened, it was in 60 towns with about 30 sites. Today, we are upwards of 170. Today, we have distinguished guests um, to join us for our first conversation at noon of the new year of 2024. We have a CEO, we have a curator, and a poet laureate. We are going to start with Dr. Duncan Harris. He's the CEO of the Capitol Campus of Connecticut State Community College in Hartford, Connecticut. Dr. Harris is recognized as an expert in student success and retention and takes pride in his role as mentor to many community college professionals. He serves on the boards of the New England Board of Higher Education and other institutions. He has received awards for his contributions to the community, including the Connecticut African American Affairs, Man of the Year, and the NAACP 100 Most Influential Blacks in Connecticut Award. He's going to be joined today by uh, Poet Laureate Antoinette Brimbell. She is Connecticut's eighth state Poet Laureate and author of three full-length poetry collections. Her poetry has appeared in various journals, magazines, textbooks, and anthologies. She is a Cave Canham Foundation Fellow and an alumna of Voices of Our Nation's Arts Foundation. Additionally, Bren Bell has published critical work and essays. A sought after speaker, editor, educator, and consultant, Bren Bell is a professor of English at Capital Community College in Hartford, Connecticut. And our next speaker after Ms. Bren Bell will be curator Frank Mitchell. He is a cultural organizer in visual arts and public humanities, interested in the histories often ignored by our cultural institutions. He is the curator at large for the Amistad Center for Art and Culture and curator curator curatorial advisor for the Tony Inn and Wendell C. Harp Historical Museum at New Haven's Dixwell Q House. He is also a consultant on the forthcoming Mystic Seaport exhibition, Entwined Freedom, Sovereignty and the Sea. Before we get started, just a little housekeeping. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in whatever platform you are looking at. We will make sure to answer all questions and uh, read all comments. Um, remember to take our survey, and let us know how we're doing and what you would like to see on our upcoming program. So now I'm going to welcome Dr. Duncan Harris to the show. Hey, Tammy, uh, glad to be here. Thank you for having me. And so, uh, you know, what I wanted to, to start with was um, some background on the, uh, the the project that we have that's uh, introduced uh, the uh, Pennington Lecture and our exhibit uh, and some curricular uh, emphasis that we've deployed over the years. And so uh, all of this rolls to uh, a project that was launched a number of years ago called uh, CT State Capitals Hartford Heritage Project. And one of the things that we wanted to do was uh, have a, a system by which we could elevate and, in, and instill in our curriculum and in our institution the rich uh, history uh, that occurs uh, in, in, uh, as tied to Hartford. Uh, and at the heart of it is a, a instructional pedagogy that focuses on place-based learning. And so within our Hartford Heritage Project, we have uh, classes at the Hartford stage. Uh, we have uh, 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 English courses. You can imagine the power of taking an English course at, at the Mark Twain House or Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, we have uh, US and, and uh, state history courses in the old state house. And we have uh, art history courses uh, through a partnership at the Wadsworth. And so um, while our primary campus is at 950 Main Street, uh, we take great pride and have a saying where we say that the city is our, our campus and that uh, we leverage the power of our city, uh, you know, for the benefit of our students and learning. And so so that's some of the backdrop. And so let me go into uh, what actually occurred with our Black History Project, which is a part of the overall Harvard Heritage Project. Um, during the summer of, of 2020, uh, I think we can all harken back to where we are, were. Uh, with the uh, the murder of, of George Floyd, um, like many institutions uh, uh, and organizations, our campus uh, was uh, impacted by that, and um, we the faculty rallied 
uh, faculty, staff, and students and said, well, well, what are we going to do? Um, I actually received a, a statement. I had sent out a statement like many other CEOs and leaders to their um, uh, individuals in their organization. And a, a faculty member uh, replied back to me, what else? And, and the, in the uh, slide that's on the screen um, is a snapshot of a Teams meeting. We were in the midst of COVID. So my faculty and staff were dispersed uh, and working from home. And we came back, uh, we came together on the heels of the murder of George Floyd to talk about what uh, that meant for us as an institution. Um, it was, uh, I guess uh, the, the stars were aligned uh, and there was a confluence there. Uh, some of our students had been working on a, a project in our liberal arts action lab, which is a partnership with, uh, with uh, Trinity, uh, where students will uh, research things related to the city. And their project was to um, bring to light the rich history of the Talcott Street Church. It just so happens that uh, Capitol, CT State Capitol, our location is directly adjacent to where the uh, uh, Talcott Street Church once stood, which was uh, Hartford's first black church and school. Uh, however, uh, every day when our students, faculty, and staff walk from the parking garage to the, into the, the campus, there is no marker. Um, it was history that, uh, as I'd mentioned, had been buried and um, uh, individuals were not aware of the hollowed ground um, where our, our institution sits and what occurred uh, in this uh, location centuries ago as it relates to uh, the education and, and liberation for black peoples uh, that were residing in, in Hartford at the time. And so, so our students actually worked on a research project to, to uncover that. And so uh, on the heels of George Floyd and his murder, we said that uh, we would um, uh, make efforts to um, build a, um, uh, a um, uh, an exhibit. We would look at our curriculum around, you know, social justice uh, and the, and the, the rights of all, uh, and that would be much more fitting than a statement. And so we made institutional changes and made an institutional commitment uh, to bring uh, forth, uh, you know, this rich history uh, and, and institutionalize that. Uh, we authored a grant to the National Endowment for the Humanities, which had those uh, prongs, which we talked about creating an exhibit, um, training faculty uh, uh, to, um, through professional development to um, integrate into curriculum cross-disciplinary. So it's not just English, it's in sociology, the architecture, all of our, our different courses where we've embedded black history uh, within uh, the curriculum and uh, holding high uh, the work of uh, Reverend uh, James C. Pennington uh, and others. And so so that's the, the backdrop and the, the genesis uh, with, uh, with which we move forth um, you know, on the projects that we'll, we'll talk about today. And so uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Professor Antoinette Bell, who will talk about the curricular piece. She'll be followed by Frank Mitchell, who will talk about the exhibit. And then I'll return to talk about uh, the Pennington Lecture. And those were three prongs that were included in our Black History Project uh, and the, the proposal and the way in which we've institutionalized you know, our uh, commitment and, and holding high rich history of uh, James E. Pennington in the Talcott Street Church. And so with that, um, I'd like to introduce Antoinette Brimbell. Uh, I have many favorite professors at my institution, uh, but she is perhaps uh, the most favorite of my favorites uh, at the institution. So uh, Antoinette Brimbell, professor of English, CT State Capitol. Thank you, Dr. Harris. I know you're always trying to pump me up right before I'm doing something. So I appreciate that vote of confidence. So um, I'm gonna just kind of pick up where I jumped in um, to all of this. Let's go back and even talk about the Hartford Heritage Project. Cause when I got here uh, almost a decade and a half ago, um, uh, Dr. Jeff Partridge, who is the director of both the Hartford Heritage Project and the Black Heritage Project, um, had just conceived this amazing idea 
to make Hartford um, a classroom. And I was a part of that group coming into Connecticut, um, fresh and new and not really understanding much about the state. And I got this wonderful, immersive um, education about the history. Um, So we traveled to different landmarks. We researched the history of um, Hartford and the people that were here and the immigration routes and all of that. And it was very interesting. And that became um, the basis for such a rich project, uh, excuse me, for such a very rich program that we have now, um, where we have institutional relationships with so many institutions, the Hartford Stage, the um, uh, the Wadsworth, just about every everywhere that, that you can go in the city, we've got some type of uh, connection um, with them. And so we really had a great template um, uh, for the Black Heritage Project, having, you know, um, come through with the Hartford Heritage Project. And once again, it was a, a deep dive into um, the historical context, the social structures, um, the geographical locations, where people were living at that particular time, what tribes were there, all of that. And we we um, started to, uh, we read a tremendous amount of information. We had great speakers come in and uh, talk to the professors. And then we went and did our own research. So um, I'm going to speak about Anne Plato because She was the one that sparked my um, interest the most Um, because being um, an English professor, being a writer, I was astounded that I knew nothing at all about her, that I had never even heard her name, and that she is the first African-American to author a book of essays in the United States. And I was thinking, now, how how did I miss that? And then to find out that, you know, she hailed from Hartford, um, I had to I had to do a really deep dive. And so I spent a lot of time researching um, Anne Plato and her circumstance. Um, it got to a point where I felt that uh, I had seen her walking across my living room. We were, <laughs> I was that involved in um, the research. And what I came to find out was that um, this individual was part indigenous and uh, part black, and that her circumstances were less than ideal. Um, At some point in her life, she might as well have been um, considered an orphan, um, having been pretty much uh, abandoned by both parents, but she found a way um, for herself. And she found that in um, the uh, Talcott Street Church, and um, she was very much supported by Reverend Pennington. So it's interesting to find how all of these pieces fit together and how they um, come together to create the perfect storm for these individuals to rise and become the um, amazing individuals that they ultimately became. So, and Plato um, wrote her book. Um, She was about 15, 16 when it was uh, published. And she asked Reverend Pennington, of course, to write the introduction for her, which I think is a pretty gutsy thing for a young lady to do. Um, He was quite taken by her and did that. And um, so we have this amazing book of essays and poetry that gives us a window into not only the individual life of Anne Plato, but gives us some kind of historical context for what was going on in um, the wider Hartford community. Um, So what I've done with all of this information is um, 
I've integrated it into um, a lot of my classes. Students are very excited when they find out that they somehow are either on sacred ground or they're a part of a larger history. And when they find out that these very important people lived right here and walked the same walks, walkways that they walk, they become very, very invested. And so um, we look at her poetry. We look at her condition, which many of the, our students can understand. Um, having to elevate yourself, um, coming from meager means and educating yourself and finding your way into a middle class. Um, all of these things that this young woman was able to do for herself, students are looking and saying, well, I can do that too. And that there is a pathway and we um, see her pathway and we understand that we too can devise our own pathway. So in addition to teaching composition and African-American literature and creative writing, I am able to take um, uh, my research and apportion it to each one of my classes. So in my creative writing classes, we look at the structure of her work. We look at what it tells us about the time. Um, we, in uh, my African-American literature class, begin to understand the um, social construct of the time and what it meant for her to self-educate, to find her way into teacher's college, to actually write a book, all of the um, uh, pitfalls that she would have to um, overcome. And it helps us to have uh, a better understanding of why we are the way we are, because I've said this before, um, our present rests sometimes uncomfortably on our past. So when we have an understanding of history, we have a better understanding of who we were, um, who we are now and who we want to be in the future. Um, and um, we look at the construction of the essays that she wrote in her composition classes and um, how she was able to demonstrate her education by pulling in not only her own thoughts, but the history um, of the time, ancient history, ancient Greek history, law, um, and to demonstrate that um, a young Black woman can um, and did um, understand and contextualize all of this um, information. So representation is very important. We know that Ann Plato was, like I said, indigenous and Black. And so when we have um, students that are diverse and varied in their own makeup, they realize that anyone can um, rise to the occasion and make a way for themselves uh, pretty much the way Anne Plato did. And I'm just speaking for myself and what I did in my English classes, but I'm telling you that other professors have taken their research and run with it. Um, so there has have uh, been courses in um, history, um, architecture. Um, the architecture was very interesting, uh, by the way. They were looking for ways to create monuments and to talk about what type of monuments should be in public spaces and that type of thing. So when you start a, a, a program like this, the possibilities are endless. And when you have such um, an ingenious faculty like uh, we do here at Capitol, they're going to run with it and make it amazingly creative. And so I'm gonna go ahead and toss it um, to Frank Mitchell, who's gonna talk about ways in which that creativity um, is evidenced. Thanks, Antoinette. And I'm going to have some slides. So I guess 
in that way if you are ready. Uh, I also want to salute uh, the great Jeff Partridge here uh, and all of his efforts to engage uh, partners across the city of Hartford, uh, and especially for the students uh, that he works with and his prompt to them uh, as he asks them what stories are missing in the landscape of Hartford history and encourages them to go out and look up and down Main Street for who whose names are recognized and whose names aren't recognized and, and so sort of make the comparison. And, and it's a great prompt. It's one that we should all be thinking about uh, as a Freedom Trail audience and partisans of the Freedom Trail. And it's certainly one that uh, structured and informed this project. What are the ways in which we can be celebrating this history that doesn't show up everywhere uh, in, in the big spaces in Hartford? Uh, Next slide, please, Nelly. Uh, and it's definitely the question that helped to structure the next few big monuments that you'll see. Uh, this one is an image from the uh, African burial ground site uh, in New York. And you may remember uh, they were preparing to build a federal building, actually the office tower where Justice or Judge Constance Baker Motley had her office on one of the top floors, ultimately. Uh, just have to note, Constance Baker Motley, she's got a stamp coming out at the end of the month, a little Freedom Trail bit there, New Haven native. So a space that you know, actually at some point began to celebrate the kind of black excellence that's so important to kind of telling these big stories. Uh, but when they found that it was also a burial ground for uh, green enslaved blacks uh, from the early part of the colonial history, uh, the work on the building had to be shut down and they began a long process of studying the remains that are there and thinking about what's the proper monument uh, to recognize and celebrate uh, that sort of solemn history. Next slide, please. Um, after this, we've got uh, the monument for the Memorial for Peace and Justice in Alabama. Uh, a, a number of great artists, both African American, uh, not Black American, and some West African are uh, part of this project to tell that story. And, and in this image, you've got work uh, from Hank Willis Thomas and from Kwame Ekorobanfo in West Africa. Uh, again, finding ways to incorporate uh, contemporary artists in recognizing uh, the sort of really complicated part of American history uh, and certainly Black American history. And the next slide, please. And this is a little image from the UVA, University of Virginia Memorial to Enslaved Laborers, uh, sort of another big project in which uh, a university and the town that supports it wrestled with the history of enslavement and ways of making sense of it through a monument, sort of a really beautiful monument and worked with designers and architects and artists and community groups uh, to make this all happen and a really uh, elegant process that we would all do well to explore and, and try to emulate at some level. But again, answering the question, whose stories are missing in these big landscapes and, and how do we celebrate them? And, and that was certainly part of what we were trying to do uh, with this curriculum project, and it was the charge from Jeff for the exhibition. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the exhibition that became uh, the Nutmeg Pulpit, uh, which is still on view uh, at Capitol. You can run right down if you're in Hartford right this minute or as soon as we get off the call and check it out, and it should be there for a while. Uh, and, and we're trying hard to program from it, but also to use it as an opportunity to advocate for some more permanent uh, memorial uh, to this history somewhere in Hartford. Uh, and, and as Antoinette said, a number of the students who are working on this project with us came up with some really uh, interesting solutions to that challenge of how do you create a space that is about teaching and learning and celebration and commemoration uh, and feels very 21st century. And that, that certainly was my hope that this would be a placeholder for a larger conversation and ultimately some sort of a monument that does that work. Uh, and we needed to draw in lots of different constituencies and challenges in making that happen. Uh, and this is where we landed. Uh, next slide, please. So initially the project was going to happen uh, outside 
of the actual campus. And so when we had our first conversations, we imagined uh, this would happen on the perimeter of the building uh, where you'd be able to look across from uh, a part of the building and see across the street into where the actual uh, Talcott Street Church used to be. Um, that site, the old Talcott Street Church, uh, which is now a parking lot, had uh, art projected onto it uh, in the mid 90s a project uh, sponsored by Real Artways with the artist Mel Chin did sort of a ghost church installation in which uh, historic images of the church were projected and sort of installed in and around the site for a really uh, interesting and compelling uh, experience. And some folks on the call may remember that. Uh, with the Chalkett Street, Chalkett Street Church's anniversary, they were also looking to find a way to celebrate at the site in some way and it, it sort of helped to push along what we were ultimately able to do but in the galleries on campus uh, next slide please and this is an image of our plan for the store windows uh, on the opposite side of the building there um, we knew we wanted to highlight some of the figures who were important in the church's history. So in this image, you get uh, our version of the first avatar for Reverend Pennington uh, and for Deacon James Mars. Uh, James Mars, sort of another important figure in Connecticut history and black Connecticut history uh, who authors the story of his uh, life as an enslaved young person and his various attempts to escape slave enslavement. Uh, and then his resolution and sort of complicated history with the folks who had held him captive all those years and, and forced him to work. So two figures who end up in Hartford and are part of pushing the Tocca Street Church forward uh, and, and whose stories needed to be recognized in any kind of monument. Uh, next slide, please. And here you see the range of avatars we ended up with. So several important stories that are critical to Harford history uh, and the church's history uh, and American history. And our challenge was finding a way to celebrate them as local icons and acknowledge sort of their impact nationally. And each of these folks uh, did important things in Hartford and in the church that reverberated uh, across the country at certain points, and for some of them internationally, sort of beyond the borders of the United States, which is kind of incredible, particularly given the time. And so what you see in the exhibition are sort of call outs to all the places that they went to or that they came from, how the world seemed sort of accessible to them in ways that are kind of unimaginable today, but in the 19th century, Mars could come from Northwest Connecticut to Hartford. Pennington could be basically everywhere between Maryland and New York and Hartford and Florida and Europe. Uh, Rebecca Primus and Plato, sort of all these folks. Augustus Washington, the photographer who had a studio in Hartford and ends up emigrating to uh, West Africa. So how much of the world was accessible to these folks, but also to other uh, Black folks who either, who somehow managed to escape enslavement and sort of were able to see the world as you know, an option for their next steps. And we wanted to at least acknowledge how important and increasingly our understanding of how important the emigration story is for uh, free Blacks in the early 19th century uh, in Connecticut, in New York, in Massachusetts, and how that conversation around do we stay here, do we go abroad is so vital and, and so important to people's sense of uh, why they stay here and why they fight to gain more freedoms. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, because this was a campaign in some ways, we thought about what kinds of swag would be important. So you get on the top of the slide uh, the stickers that we used on the days of the public presentation. We worked with students uh, to show what we were imagining and to do sort of a charrette on site on the opposite side of the building with the windows that are uh, used by the Wadsworth Museum shop uh, and included these little stickers for everybody. Uh, one of the concerns was that 
since we weren't doing this in the galleries proper, people might be confused by this campaign that had sort of church overtones and referenced Reverend Pennington. So on the stickers, you can't really see this. We decided to run around the perimeter. This is not a church, but your soul can get happy. This is not a church. So lots of really fun call outs, uh, reminding folks this isn't a church, but it doesn't mean that social justice work and your humanity won't be recognized in the gallery and in the exhibition. Uh, next slide, please. And this is uh, the design uh, for the wall in the gallery once we brought the uh, exhibition into the gallery at Capitol. This was the plan for it. Uh, this, you will see a version of this when you come <laughs> to the gallery uh, to check out the exhibition. Not everything that we discussed is on this layout, but this is sort of the big picture. Uh, the avatars, the various figures who we wanted to lift up, and Plato, uh, Rebecca Primus, the educator, Augustus Washington, the photographer and activist, uh, Reverend Pennington and James Mars are all here with their stories and, and various ways of engaging and sort of learning more about them, along with uh, some great technology that helps you navigate the work that students have been doing uh, and some of the work that faculty have done as well. So you get a really great sense of how the prompt has inspired both folks in the classroom and folks who are leading classes in the classroom. Uh, and to some extent, some visitors. Uh, there's a bit of a contem contemplation uh, set in the gallery as well. So you can sit and reflect on some of this. Uh, and because their words were so important, the say it loud, say it proud is critical. So there's a lot of text that reminds you that these folks were activists. They were writing and speaking and making their way in the world and sort of creating a space for future generations to make a difference. We really wanted that to be part of, of what folks took from the exhibition because partly because it was in a space where education is hallowed, but also because uh, the word and speech and prophecy is so critical uh, in religious spaces in general. So there's a lot of that happening in the exhibition in interactive ways. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and this may be where I will um, close and look forward to any questions or conversation afterwards. So I think I'm passing it back to you, Duncan, to wrap us up and lead us into questions. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, uh, Frank. So the, uh, and as, as Frank alluded to, uh, the exhibit is, is open, right? And so hopefully some of the folks that might be viewing, uh, you have your, your curiosity piqued by what you've seen and, and the amount of uh, effort that's gone in. And so it, it's on the first floor of, of the college. And so uh, as uh, guests are able to come in, they would just check in with our, um, our campus uh, staff uh, in the lobby area. And it's, it's directly to the right as you come in, you can see uh, portions of it from the, um, from the, the uh, main street. And so once again, uh, we are hopeful that, that uh, folks get an opportunity to stop by. And so, uh, you know, uh, the last part of, of this presentation uh, is tied to the Pennington Lecture Series. And so uh, what we wanted to establish, once again, as we, we harken back to, uh, you know, this idea of, of institutionalizing, um, you know, this uh, movement in some regard to elevate history of, of uh, Tal the Talcott Street Church and some of the figures that, uh, you know, spent time there was to have uh, an ongoing uh, lecture series that we plan for uh, annually. Um, one of the things that we decided to do early on was to collaborate with some of our uh, partners uh, and uh, Professor Brim Bell talked about the Hartford Heritage Project. And so some of our long-term partners in that initiative have been the Wadsworth uh, Athenaeum, Athenaeums who had been there since day one, uh, and also the Amistad Center for Arts and Culture. And so those have been long-standing uh, partners that we reached out to say, are, um, are you interested in um, uh, collaborating in an ongoing way um, in bringing, um, you know, internationally recognized thought leaders in the space of social justice, in particular, uh, Black social justice, and um, to, to Hartford? 
uh, and um, and there was a, a resounding yes. Uh, the other um, um, uh, institution that we felt very strongly about including in the planning um, is Faith Congregational Church, which um, um, was formerly uh, has its, its history tied to the Talcott Street Church in, in Reverend Pennington. So, so from day one, we uh, decided to include them in, in this partnership. And so, so what we did was uh, we began to, to look at some of the themes around social justice, et cetera, and we we um, canvassed who some of our our national thought leaders uh, were or are uh, in these areas, scholars uh, that are able to to speak to, um, you know, these topics. And so uh, what you have on this slide, are, uh, and I'll talk about briefly, um, are the, um, the three individuals, um, and actually the third one is about to come up, but that we've tapped thus far. So the, for the first year, uh, we reached out and uh, we're very happy to invite uh, Dr. Sarah uh, Lewis uh, to, to Hartford, one of the things that we've we've uh, consistently done is that we encourage faculty, staff, and students, uh, and will uh, to participate in a common read. Uh, we actually provide the books and things like that. Uh, many of the faculty will uh, coordinate uh, assignments and things like that. So, you know, I, I can recall um, when I was um, uh, uh, doing some work. You know, the the idea of of meeting an author. Like, yeah, I'm going to read the book, but then. Uh, I remember reading, uh, you know, Cornell West, and then he later came to UConn, and it was a really big deal for me as a, as a young scholar. And so, so similarly, what we've done is we've we've identified individuals. We'll, we'll have a common read on campus, and then uh, with the culmination being a, a visit. And so, uh, so year one, uh, we read The Rise, uh, you know, as a campus. Uh, you know, Sarah Lewis is a is a Harvard uh, professor of, of art history. Uh, of art and architecture and African and American studies at Harvard and, and you know, a national thought leader. And so, um, so we invited her in for the, uh, the first um, uh, lecture series. Uh, year two in 2023, uh, we reached out uh, to Dr. Jelani Cobb. You know, of course, he's a, a, a New York uh, columnist uh, in The New Yorker. Uh, and also on the faculty at, at Columbia. He's actually the, the dean of the School of, uh, of Journalism there. Uh, a national thought leader in, in terms of social justice and issues of race in uh, the U.S. And so so uh, he agreed to come. And the photo in the slide is actually of uh, of Dr. Cobb and um, Cleo Moses, who is the, uh, the current uh, pastor at uh, Faith Congregational Church and some of the members. And so um, so once again, they also participated in that. And I'm delighted to share with uh, the audience uh, today uh, that um, we have uh, in a few short weeks, uh, Dr. Eddie Cloud, uh, who is, of course, a, a, a professor of African American studies at Princeton University. You may have also seen him on MSNBC. He's a, a commentator on issues of race and uh, in the U.S. Um, and, and scholar of, of history. And so, um, you know, and oftentimes it takes a lot of work. So we we were working on on getting him and uh, for <laughs> about a year. And uh, but he has strong ties to Hartford, um, and he has uh, actually um, received an, an award a number of years ago in honor of, of Reverend Pennington um, by the University of Helsinki. And so he was named a, a, a Reverend Pennington Scholar. He's a thought leader nationally and historian on the life of Reverend Pennington. So he was he was very honored uh, to have been selected, and so he's excited about that. The other tie that we have to uh, Dr. Cloud is that um, uh, CT State Capital has a program where um, black males interested in attending uh, Morehouse College uh, can come to um, to Capital, study here, and then transfer with uh, junior status to Morehouse. And so we entered into an arrangement uh, with Morehouse uh, about a year ago to launch this program. And so uh, Dr. Cloud is is one of Morehouse. Uh, distinguished alumni and uh, is actually a member of, of their board. And so when he heard about, um, you know, our program, uh, he was excited and actually asked to um, come meet with our Morehouse scholars uh, prior to his talk on the 8th. So we're very excited about uh, him coming and participating, uh, you know, giving his talk that, that night, uh, but equally important, um, you know, spurring 
uh, the scholarship interest of the uh, young black males uh, currently attending Capitol uh, interested in, uh, and that will be transferring to Morehouse um, um, next fall. So, so there's, you know, those, those ties. Um, what I did want to do at this point, uh, the, the event on the 8th is actually uh, in person event is full, but um, we have the opportunity for individuals that would like to um, view that um, virtually. Um, you can still um, register for the virtual uh, lecture that evening. So uh, that's on the, the Wadsworth site. It's also on uh, CT State Capital site. Uh, and perhaps we'll be able to include the, the link um, later. Um, and so, so very excited about this. This is a, once again tied to Professor Brim's comments, a way that we're, we uh, fuse this into, you know, to our curriculum, you know, with common reads. And once again, um, bringing authors and, and national thought leaders on issues um, tied to social justice um, and equity, you know, to our the city we love, um, and with our partners, and and once again um, for the benefit of our students. And so, uh, I see that we're we're right at at twelve forty five. I, I guess we would have the opportunity to open it up for some conversation and, and questions, and I'll turn it back over to Tammy. Oh my goodness, thank you so very much. This was very exciting to learn and to hear. Um, we do have a couple of questions and then we'll um, take it from there. Um, Andre Critt says, good afternoon. Um, he wants to know, is the Talcott Street site where Pennington preached as, a, is, as opposed to the Faith Congregational site on Main Street in Hartford? So he's asking, either one of you can answer. Um, if the Talcott Street site is where he preached versus or uh, opposed to the um, Faith Congregational on Main Street. Would have been the site contemporary for uh, Pennington. The Main Street site is a more recent church site. Okay, so it would have been definitely there, okay. Yeah, it and was then, all downtown at that point. And that would have been a neighborhood where it would have been sort of the center of a more bustling, but very small black heart group. Got you. Um, he says, you mentioned different places in the world where Pennington showed up. Can you say some of the places other than Hartford and Farmington, Connecticut, where he may have appeared? He actually, he traveled overseas as a matter of fact. And so, um, so he um, uh, came up from Virginia originally, right? And uh, escaped um, uh, uh, enslavement, spent time in New York uh, and then came to Hartford, but then was also uh, went to Florida at one point uh, and was assigned to a church there, but then also to the Caribbean. So he, he was the equivalent of, you know, of a, of a Martin Luther King, you know, but at that time, so you can imagine pre, you know, social media and all these other things. But um, but he uh, was well traveled, and uh, he also um, officiated uh, one of the the, uh, the weddings for for Frederick Douglass uh, and and things like that. So he um, was an iconic figure uh, at the time, and that's one of the things where we're, you know, we've been very excited about. Um, especially for our students, Capital is a very diverse school. We're 37% black in terms of the student population, 33% Hispanic. And so this idea of, of bringing historic, iconic leaders and figures uh, to life, you know, that walked this same place is very powerful. So, you know, we have a new student orientation where we've mentioned, you know, Reverend Pennington and the fact that where our students come in 2024, you know, when the, the Talcott Street, which was the first black school in 1819, that so for centuries, uh, black people have been coming to this space to, to be educated and, and have access to the liberating power of education. So, so it's a very powerful kind of concept that we've folded into who we are as an institution. I love the idea that he was a world traveler, if you will. 
um, it, it paints a contrast of how when enslavement is taught and as well as those who have received their freedom, how they stayed localized and were more or less sort of hampered to stay in that position. Whereas this is helping us to see it's quite a different story that no, they had access to the world and that they did travel. So thank you so much for bringing that part out. Um, Andre wanted to know if the place you were referring to, um, Frank, if that place was called The Bottoms. Mm, I, was that area called the bottoms? <laughs> I wouldn't have called it that. I think it was it was really at that point it was just is a small it's a small neighborhood. It was just a small neighborhood, but in general the the population at that time would not have referred or the society at that time would not have referred to it as the bottoms. I think that's a little bit later than we're talking about. I mean this really is there just is beginning to be a black community there. I mean most people still it's sort of not long after gradual emancipation, not too long after the revolution. And we're beginning to see these small pop communities of Blacks emerging around Connecticut. I mean, one of the nice things, or one of the fascinating things about Connecticut is that it's sort of a bellwether for so many of these trends and it's early in that. So people are moving about a lot. And we see this certainly in all of the major cities as folks move from smaller parts of the state into these larger parts and really create community. And so what's the show is called Black Community Formation because it really is about uh, Blacks showing up in Hartford, in Middletown, in New Haven, uh, and creating community in the early 19th century as slavery is beginning to be gradually emancipated. And, and how important these churches are in making that happen for a whole bunch of reasons. And, and we think about this as being because people were in segregated spaces or because they were so religious, but there also really is a sense in which this is a political site, that you have a church and the church is political power. And for congregational churches, the people who got the best seats in the congregational church, the center church in New Haven, the center church in Hartford, had the most political power. They were wealthy and they had power. And so if you're watching this and in your enslaved person sitting in whatever seat you live in or sit in, what you see is to have political power and to gain wealth, we need to have our own church. And so you get these churches popping up, not necessarily in the places that have the most uh, captive enslaved or black people. So there are plenty of folks uh, in New London at this point, it's, it's right there on the water and ships are coming in but we see churches appearing in New Haven and, and in Hartford uh, and in Middletown. And sort of one of the things people are still working on is, well, what does that mean? What do we know? How does this, what should we take from the fact that these are the sites where this kind of activism is happening? And these are also the sites when, where people who having gained their freedom in whatever ways and are having to pay taxes are lobbying for citizenship or saying, you can't tax us if we can't vote. Uh, and in New Haven, in sort of the areas around New Haven, in the areas outside and inside of Hartford, you get that kind of activism uh, for a bunch of reasons. And so these are the kinds of questions that having these church starts and digging into this history and thinking about who was there and thinking about their access to the world uh, leads us to ask these kinds of questions about well, what else is going on? Why was it going on there? And, and what does this mean? Awesome. Um, this question is open. Um, Professor Burnbell, don't worry, I, I'm coming back around because I do have a question for you that I think only you could answer. Um, the Alex Brion Corporation would like to know, how do students receive and respond to this local black history and does it inspire activism or greater interest in their own history in or genealogy? Yeah, I, they, they respond you know, favorably uh, for some of them, it, it, it ignites a, a fire in their belly. Uh, you could imagine we've um, invite annually, we invite the, the students that participated in the uh, original research project uh, that um, to the Pennington lecture. And we honor them, that, you know, based off of what they, uh, how they inspired us to. Um, and so there's a piece around research understanding uh, where you come from. Uh, and so, so for many of our students, it's been inspiring, uh, you know, and uh, hopefully folks get a chance to visit. Um, 
the way in which Frank designed the space um, is it's it's striking and it pulls you in with bright colors and images. Uh, and so so there's a piece to, you know, um, it's it's uh, it's provocative in a way that really elicits an interest in learning more and kind of saying, well, hey, who who are these folks? Uh, they look like me. Many of them, 37 percent of our students, you know, as I mentioned, are of African ancestry. And uh, and so they do respond very favorably. Um, I've heard from some of the students. We have a, a group called Sister to Sister, uh, which is a mentoring uh, program here for, for uh, female students of color that um, um, have taken Professor Brims Bell's class and, and learning about Anne Plato uh, and how they've been inspired, you know, by that uh, model uh, that that's been put forth. And so so they respond uh, very favorably. Uh, and it's one of the hallmarks of our institution. Great. Um, we have some links in the chat. If you uh, feel um, free to um, copy those down, it'll lead you to the Pennington Lecture. Um, Jeff Partridge, who uh, we couldn't have today with us, but he does have here, he says, there are some student quotes on the page of the Hartford Heritage website, and it's the hartfordheritage.org backslash black heritage. So those are there in the chat for our audience to uh, review. Another question is, does, did James Pennington have any connection to Center Church in Hartford? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if he did or not. Um... Okay. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Brim Bell. I want to know, how do you feel or how do you think the two women, uh, Ann Plato and Ms. Sumprimus, as free women who use their agency and their platform the way that they did, especially during the time of sexism and women are supposed to be seen and not heard, how do you think that influences us today? How do you think that played a role and for the women of that time as well, but mainly for today, for younger people who are learning about them. You got to unmute, you got to unmute. There always has to be one person who doesn't unmute. It's usually um, me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was like, um, from the perspective of Ann Plato and to go back and underscore um, what Dr. Harris was saying about how encouraged students become when they learn about this history. When they find out the people that they're studying about um, had beginnings that are um, less, than, less than optimal and that from those very meager beginnings, they're able to make something very big out of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, I think it really does create um, excitement and energy and lets people, uh, lets our students know that um, you're not tethered to, um, you know, where you were when you were born. Uh, I'd love to talk about Ann Plato because to me, she was absolutely brilliant to be able to be inherently homeless, living in someone else's home, taking care of their family at a very young age mm -hmm. and looking around and saying, okay, how am I gonna get myself out of this situation? How am I gonna thrive? Not just survive, but how am I gonna thrive? And while I'm thriving, how am I gonna give something back? And um, realizing at an early age, that education was going to be um, the way that she did that. And then looking around and saying, well, you know, it's not easy um, for um, a young woman who is Black and Indigenous to be educated, but I have someone who likes playing teacher with me and who will teach me. And I am serving in a house where there are 10 tons of books and she avails herself of that. Mm -hmm. And so she seizes these opportunities for herself and the students see that in themselves. They're sitting there in those chairs and they begin to seize those opportunities for themselves, knowing that they can envision 
um, a, a future that is bigger and brighter than the one that society um, mm -hmm. says that they're entitled to. And even me just talking about it makes me very excited. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can kind of see that. I get it. No, but I'm with, I'm right there with you. That energy is right there. As a historian, I love to bring these stories to the fore so that, um, so that people can understand our history is so much bigger than what society will have us boxed into. And I love making the historical connections. I know it's the Black Heritage Project in Hartford but it helps me to think about the historical connection of Mary and Eliza Freeman in Bridgeport. These two sisters were real estate moguls at a time where that was impossible for white women, let alone black women. And so I'm just listening to you talk and I'm here. It's just giving me such inspiration and such encouragement and energy because it goes beyond just surviving. It's thriving and then bringing those along with you. Not just it's all about me. It's about whoever wants to know and whoever wants to learn can come along with me. And that's the piece that really gives me the most energy is that um, society will have you think, oh, it's just a one sided one mind situation when in reality no it was about the community and bringing the community along so oh my goodness this has been so exciting thank you all so very much for taking the time to come and join me today at conversations at noon i really appreciate you um Again, thank you for the audience for your questions. We have an upcoming program next month with Professor Ray Wimbush. Um, it is talking about Belinda Royal Sutton or Belinda the African, reparations then and now. It, he has a book out that he wrote a few years ago and it, and it talks about Belinda Sutton whose uh, petition to re receive her reparations at the time in 1779, to receive her, uh, her reparations and how that petition is very instrumental in reparations for the descendants of enslaved people today. Then March, Tuesday, March 26, 2024, not 2023, we have the life of Private William Webb, where Kevin Johnson from the Connecticut State Library will speak upon him. And then Tuesday, April 23rd, 2024, we have Bringing the Freedom Trail to Life for Real. And this is going to be a revisit conversation by Andre Kitt. So again, everyone, thank you so very much, Professor Harris, Professor Brembell, and Dr. Frank Mitchell. I thank all of you for being with us today. And again, everyone, please join us next week or next month. And um, there are others that you can visit on our YouTube page and also on the Connecticut Freedom Trail uh, website at ctfreedomtrail.org. So until the next time, everyone, thank you.